Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa, Linda, and Annie, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, welcome back to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. I'm Jean Thomas. And I'm Teresa Golden. And today we're talking with Brianna Davis of Green Bee Greenhouse in Cornwallville, New York. The topic is growing herbs, and we're making this part of our 101 series, meaning that we're starting from scratch for new growers who may be intimidated by the thought of growing herbs. Since there seems to be a great mystique that has grown up over the centuries, we'll do our own magic. As usual, we can break it down to be less daunting and more fun. Brianna, you were asked to join us today because your interest in healthy living has brought you to using organic methods and you're also a commercial and home gardener who's aware of pollination and global warming issues. With all that awareness, herbs are a natural response to dealing with many issues. Let's start with the definition for our conversation. We're using the Merriam-Webster definition of an herb as a plant or plant part valued for its medicinal, savory, or aromatic value. Does that pretty much fit what you're working with? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. We're sorting herbs into three categories for our convenience as a useful way to address the topic. Different people mean different plants when they say herbs, and usually it's according to these criteria. So let's start there. First, let's eliminate medicinal herbs. There are many plants grown for medicinal purposes, but since we're talking about a beginner's level of learning about growing herbs, there will be no discussion of how to use the plants medicinally at home. Many herbs are grown for their scents and craft value, the Artemisia family includes mugwort and wormwood, along with many types used as ornamental shrubs, silver king and silver mound, for example. They all have beautiful silver foliage, and Brianna has a warning about the Artemisia family. Yes, I do not recommend planting Artemisia. I have read that the silver mound species is not as invasive, but Artemisia vulgaris is the one that's most commonly used for its medicinal properties, and you can find it almost anywhere. It is highly invasive. It's on the New York State invasive list, and dig it up wherever you find it and use it as much as you want, <laughs> but don't plant it. Okay. For scented leaves and, and that wonderful aroma, lavender is a little bit trickier to grow, but worth the effort. The soothing aroma and the flowers are gorgeous to dry. On the opposite side of the aroma spectrum are the mints. They're easy. In fact, there's another invasive. Yeah, we always recommend keeping the mints in pots. It's on some of our signage, and when we are selling mint in the nursery, it's it's highly recommended to keep it in a container and to put a saucer underneath it so that it doesn't go out the bottom and into your soil. They are sneaky. They are very sneaky. <laughs> I call them colonizers. Mm -hmm. They want to take over the world. There's an overlap between craft-scented herbs and the culinary, partly because so many herbs have either a lemony or licorice scent, common across genera. The culinary herbs seem to be an enormous category, not just parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, but garlic and ginger, basil, oregano, and dill. Boy, I'm getting want to eat. <laughs> herbs are used in every kind of cooking, baking, canning, and many, many teas. We all have a list of our favorite herbs, and when we want to grow herbs, we must make a decision like any garden decision. Do we want containers or ornamental beds or garden rows dedicated to growing a crop? What do you recommend? Well, I have a few recommendations. It depends on how far your garden is from your kitchen and your front door. For us, we have a very large garden. Many of you have seen it when you've come to the nursery, but we keep our culinary herbs that we use every single day right on our deck. It's right outside the back door. I can just pop out there and grab what I need when I'm cooking. And in those pots, I usually grow the things that I use the most often. So I have rosemary, oregano, some basil, although I do grow a lot more basil right in the ground in the garden, chives, tarragon, sage, the things that I use the most often, I keep closest to the kitchen. And then there are certain herbs that you can use both 
for culinary purposes and for aromatics and for ornamental properties. And those I tend to plant everywhere. We have lavender in a lot of spots in our in our gardens. They Lavenders really prefer very w- well-drained soil. They don't like to have their roots cold or wet during the winter, especially in the s- spring and fall months when it's chilly and wet. So it need, they need really well-drained soil and full, full sun. And that's something that you can incorporate into those areas that are not, you know, in containers. So those containers you have on your deck, is that full sun? You have... It is. Well, it's pretty full sun. I mean, some of them get more sun than others, but the herbs that don't need to flower, and most of them you, you really want to prevent from flowering anyway, they can take about a half a day of shade. Okay. So um, you have to consider that with your containers. Mm-hmm. They can get a little bit leggy. If they're getting leggy, of course, you could just move the container into more sun. Or and cut them and use them. them and use them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, starting herb plants, you know more about that than anybody I know. <laughs> Are different methods better for different plants? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we grow thousands, thousands of plants of herbs every single year. We tend to grow the easier, faster ones from seed, and then we put those into containers for people to plant in their gardens because it still takes some of them a really long time, and you get a nice, robust plant that you can start using right away if you if you get it from from us. But you can also plant certain things from seed. So. On the list of things you can plant directly in your garden from seed are cilantro, dill, basil. Those are some of the easiest ones, and they're the shortest life cycle, basically. And some of them reseed themselves. And they do. The cilantro and the dill will both easily reseed. Those are plants that I recommend people either sow every three weeks or plant a few plants in early spring to get yourself going. And then when they flower, you can take the seed and just put it right back in the soil once it's a little bit brown and dry and ready to go. And that way you'll start the process of having the cilantro and the dill all the time. Mine are free range. They go where they want. I go find them. (laughs) So what are some of the slower herbs that we might be better off with a starter plant instead of doing it by seed? So the plants that I find to be slower that I start from starter plants rather than seed myself in in the commercial greenhouse are sage, rosemary, tarragon, chives. You can do either way. Let's see what else. Oregano, lavender definitely is a very long crop. Takes a while. Thyme. There are so many different varieties of thyme that we grow. I think we grow seven or eight different types of thyme. So that's a great one. It grows very fast once you get it into the garden, but it's it's better to start that way. And then the mints. The mints I do both ways. I sometimes propagate from my own stock in the garden where I just take little cuttings and stick them and then keep them on a heat mat and wait for them to grow out until they're rooted, or I get in new varieties that I don't have growing in my own garden. Do you have to get a whip to keep them back in line once they do take <laughs> off? We fortunately, we have enough space that we've found some spots in our on our property that we can kind of let them go wild. Okay. And that's okay where we've put them. Yeah. It's for people who have especially a small garden or raised bed gardens, I never recommend putting mint yeah. Or other things in the mint family directly. And like lemon balm is another one that will grow rampantly. They just will, in about five years, that's all you will have. And then once you have it, it's very difficult to remove. But if you do have a big space and a lot of places that you are cultivating and you don't mind if something can really run and form a big colony, that's when I find it's okay to put it in the ground. So you could use it as a ground cover. You can definitely use it as a ground cover. really want to. If you really want to. And also, if you put it at the edge of a space that you're mowing, uh-huh. so it always mm. has a finite place. It can't go further than that if it's hitting the edge of wherever you're mowing or string trimming or whatever. So if you've got mint on one edge of your lawn and thyme on the other edge, by the time you're finished mowing, you are starving. <laughs> <laughs> All the great aroma coming up at you. Okay, now seed starting. You talk about things like arugula and basil and cilantro, parsley, sage. I have done sage from seed, but it takes a really long time. Yeah, so that's not really... No, I I list that in the ones that are easier from From starter plants. Okay, and I see nasturtiums pop Mm -hmm. up. Now, nasturtiums are easy from seed. They are very easy from seed. And once they're established, they're wonderful, but I consider them... A fall flower at my house. Mm-hmm. They it- do take a while, especially if you are planting them directly in the ground. We do both. In my own garden, 
I tend to pop some seeds in because it's just a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. But uh, we also grow out full nasturtium plants and calendula plants for people to put directly in the garden. We have actually, so we grow nasturtium, calendula, and also gem marigolds, which are very, very small edible marigolds. They're the ones with the lacy foliage? They have lacy, very, very fragrant mm -hmm. foliage. Mm -hmm. They're called citrus gems. So we have lemon gem, tangerine gem, and red gem that we grow. Sometimes they get mixed together, and I can't tell which is which until they bloom. But okay. sometimes I can keep them separate. And they add a lot of color to the garden. They're great for pollinators, and you can pop them into salads. They're a little bit more bitter than the calendula petals and then. Uh, not as spicy as the nasturtiums, but they are really beautiful. I like all that color. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you're thinking of an herb garden, now you've got nice containers on your porch by your kitchen, mm -hmm. your your potager. Some people imagine this this geometric, planned out, spacey thing, and that's their only definition of an herb garden. And others just want to let it loose. Mm -hmm. Is there an ideal? Should you could should you tailor your design to the plants you know like like if you've got like you say with the, the lavender needs certain conditions so if you have those conditions isn't it kind of wise to put all the herbs that prefer those kind what are they mediterranean mm -hmm. herbs yeah together so learning about the herbs might be a better way to start sure i mean i think that goes that is wise wisdom both in the garden and in a container. Uh -huh. I like to do some mixed containers. And when I do that, I make sure that I'm choosing herbs that will grow well together that all like the same culture. Yeah. So I will put rosemary and thyme and maybe lavender all in the same pot. Uh -huh. But I wouldn't put a mint in there with it. Because the mint, first of all, is going to take over just even the pot. <laughs> and also the mint really needs a lot of more water. And the rosemary, thyme, sage, they need, and lavender, they need more well-drained, drier soil. They don't want to be wet. They don't want to be wet. Okay. Exactly. I made the mistake once of trying to plant basil with parsley, and that was not a good combination. Because hmm. uh, parsley likes it dry and the basil likes it wet. Um, so you learn. Yeah. <laughs> then I find parsley to be fairly adaptable, and I grow that both in a container right near the kitchen, and also I grow a lot of it in the garden. When we think of something related to food like herbs, we often want to think about preserving so that you can use them out of season. Any special tips on how to do that successfully? You know, I've had a lot of people talk to me about freezing herbs, which is something that I always mean to do, and I never get around to it. But I know that you can do that. I think people have told me that they roll parsley and sage up into a, like a log and freeze it that way and then just slice up what they need. I tend to dry herbs. I dry a lot of oregano and I freeze sage leaves whole. That's a very easy one. They It almost seems like they're fresh. They don't, you know, wilt or anything really. I make a lot of pesto and I freeze that. I freeze that without cheese in it and then I add cheese in later. So that's a good tip preservation wise. Rosemary tends to stay okay in a pot for a little while. We bring our container of rosemary in and this is a question I get all the time. Is rosemary hardy? Can I just plant it in the garden? How do I get it through the winter? You just have to treat rosemary like an annual. I have tried so many different methods of getting it through the winter over the years, and I've tried different varieties of rosemary. I actually think it's plant-specific. I think every once in a while someone magically gets a plant that likes living through the winter in the house, and it's fine, and they can have that plant for, like, you know, 10 years. It's amazing. And... They tell everyone about it. That's how rumors get started. And no one else can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've tried everything from misting to keeping it dry to keeping it wet to keeping it in an unheated space to keeping it in a heated space. I have not really had that much success. It's not worth it. But you can bring it in the house and use it like fresh rosemary until around, I find, December, January, when the whole plant will just crash. And then you have dried rosemary. So you take off all the leaves <laughs> and you put the pot outside and then you start again in the spring. You have no idea how much sauce that is to the rest of us. <laughs> Actually, the, another question that I get a lot, I want to just go back to if that's okay. The dill and cilantro, a lot of people, especially newer gardeners, come in and say, I can't grow dill and I can't grow cilantro. It's a disaster. Those are two of the easiest ones to grow. The question comes in when they go to seed so quickly. And so 
what I like to tell people is that you're not doing anything wrong. That's just the, the plant has a fast life cycle. Some of these other herbs that we grow, they don't go to seed the first year or they almost never flower like rosemary and sage. And so you, there's a misconception that people are doing something wrong. But dill and cilantro, really, they just, they grow very quickly. They put on that beautiful flush of foliage that you want to use. And if you, you use that up, it's going to re-sprout more foliage, but eventually it will just go to seed because that's its life cycle. So you can use the flowers. They're edible on both cilantro and dill. And then you can obviously also use the seed when they're fresh and green. They have a wonderful, very, very intense flavor. And then as they dry and they turn brown, that's when you can collect them, you can grind them, use them as a spice later, or you can just pull them off the plant and replant them right in the soil and get a new flush of foliage. Or let them go free range. Right. And I've always got some popping up. Yeah. Because I'm not a tidy gardener. <laughs> but they're happy. They're happy volunteers they're to have, happy. right? You yeah. just have to remember where they come up. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the one thing I do know of that I've actually done is the ice cube thing. Mm-hmm. Where you could take leaves, basil is the easiest one, and just put them in ice cube trays with water, and then you just plunk the ice cubes into your soup or whatever you're doing, and it does its own thing. So that always works for me when they do their own thing. Fantastic. <laughs> Cornell Cooperative Extension can help with specifics, and there's links in the show notes, so there's all kinds of recipes and preservation things. When in doubt, email the hotline at columbiagreenmgv at cornell.edu. The MGV cookbook is also available and contains not just recipes, but many growing tips. I think you donated something to the cookbook. I don't know if a I recipe have, but I or something. It. I would be happy to. Okay, I think you did. Okay. So, Brianna, we try to close on a very positive note. So, let's talk about what the long term benefits of growing your own herbs are. Wow, that's a big question. I think it's very rewarding and it adds a lot of interest to your garden and to your cooking. And it saves you a lot of money because fresh herbs in the store are packaged in a lot of plastic and they're quite expensive. And so if you can just grow your own stuff, it's always more convenient and you always have it available. Yeah, I find growing herbs to be really fun. So philosophically, they're for the entertainment and the food value. And I find that herbs have a color range visually as a gardener that's unique and they're subtle and they work in with well, I we already know. I'm I'm a medley gardener. Mm-hmm. So things like a sage, big fat sage plant among your marigolds yeah, is, is fabulous. They're gorgeous. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And the other positive is they're deer resistant in mm-hmm. many mm-hmm. cases. Yes, almost all of them are. I think they, they might go after basil sometimes, but yeah, and parsley. What would you like us to cover that we have neglected to ask you about? I feel like I didn't really answer your question about more formal gardens. Mm -hmm. And I think that you can do whatever you want to do aesthetically with the herbs. There are some very beautiful formal applications of herb planting. I've seen people create little rock garden situations that they usually fill with herbs. The creeping herbs like thyme and oregano and sage that really like that dry kind of friable soil do very well in that situation. That's a little bit more formal. I have seen some really very formal spaces that with a lot of repetition, so a lot of plants of each type, which can be so beautiful. And I, I've also seen a lot of very beautiful freeform places. I mean, if you let your herbs go to seed, you get those beautiful flowers, which bring in all the pollinators, and then they self-sow, and it can be very kind of flowy and beautiful, and you still get to use it in your cooking. So it really just depends on what your own aesthetic is. And I don't think that the herbs care. They just want to be in a happy, sunny place where they can grow. Okay. And one of the things I don't think we covered enough was the cooking. Mm -hmm. We wanted to talk about culinary herbs, but I didn't hear any recipes or uh, Oh, I could talk about cooking all day. (laughs) I'd love to cook. Give us some highlights. Let's see. This time of year, I really like to make a kale salad with a dark lacinata kale and some radicchio, a lot of radishes, apples from my favorite farm stands. And I chop that all up. I put it in a dressing with garlic, lemon juice, olive oil, and a ton of oregano, a lot of oregano, and a lot of parsley. Mix that all together. Put some pomegranate seeds and some toasted almonds in. That's one of my favorite fall salads. I'm, might be spring. I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa and I have drooler really at our faces. <laughs> What else you got? <laughs> Let's see. I mean, of course, you've got the, 
classic tomato salad in the spring with basil. I make kind of an alternative to bouilli salad where I use quinoa instead of bulgur wheat and tomatoes and cucumbers and a ton of parsley chopped really finely. We grow two types of parsley. We grow the curly parsley and the flat leaf parsley. I find them both delicious. The curly is a little bit better for cooked dishes, I find, and the flat leaf is a little bit more tender, so I tend to use that in raw applications. And tarragon is one of my favorite herbs to use with roasted potatoes mixed with Mm. rosemary. So crispy potatoes in a really hot oven, and then in the last five minutes, you just throw a bunch of rosemary and tarragon right on top and get it nice and crispy. Delicious. (laughs) <laughs> Teresa's disintegrating before our eyes. I told you I could talk about, I could definitely talk about cooking all day long. Today. Oh, we also, we didn't talk about the difference between perennial herbs and annual herbs. So there are a lot of herbs. Tarragon and chives are some of the most reliable perennial herbs. I find that tarragon unfortunately gets dug up a lot in the spring by mistake because when it first starts to sprout, it doesn't look like tarragon and it doesn't smell or taste like tarragon. It just It doesn't really have any aroma until it gets a little bit bigger. So that one I think gets weeded out a lot, but it will come back reliably every year if you know where you put it. Chives are the same way, and if you let them go to seed, they will spread around, and you get beautiful chive flowers, which you can pop right into vinegar and get this beautiful pink-flavored vinegar. Don't forget to talk about garlic. Garlic. (laughs) Yeah, I guess I don't usually put garlic into the category of herbs in my mind, but I understand why it's there. Garlic, you plant now. We're about to plant ours this week or this weekend. This being November. November. Yeah. Right. You plant it in November. It's just underground all you know, all winter long. And then in the spring, it starts to come up. Around June, you can harvest the garlic scapes, which you can use in many applications. I've actually just started using it just like a vegetable. I chop it up into about one-inch chunks and saute it with some olive oil. And my kids eat it as if they're green beans. It's great. You can also put it into pesto or, you know, anywhere you would use garlic. It's just a little bit more mild. So the whole allium family is magic. Agree. (laughs) Garlic is the king. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it after the scapes, you get about two or three more weeks, and then you can harvest the whole thing. Well, so Brianna, thank you very much. As always, it's a pleasure to have you. We hope you'll come back again. I would love to. It's always fun to talk with all of you. Thank you so much for having me back. Thank you. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Powers and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at columbiagreenmgb at cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 